I'm Megan. I'm Colin. And this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional. Confessional. An open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. Hello everybody and welcome back. Photography is a major part of being a pet sitter. And yet, many of us have no idea what we're doing with it. So that's why we are so excited to have Caitlin McCall, owner of Ragamuffin Pet Photography and currently co-president of the Pet Photographers Club and running their own podcast as well on to talk about pet photography specifically, the skills that we need and how we can use those photos to better our business. Caitlin, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, Hi, thanks so much for having me, Colin. I am very excited to talk all things pet photography, in case you can't tell from that bio. Um, That's (laughs) My entire life. So um, I have been a professional pet photographer for 12 years now. Um, It's everything. I absolutely love it. Best job in the world. Combining photography and pets is just my two big passions. So, yeah, I started Ragamuffin Pet Photography 12 years ago. And then I am so obsessed with pet photography that I started the International Pet Photographers Club uh, in 2018 with the co-president, Kirsty. So we teach other pet photographers how to run their own businesses. Um, and I also teach pet lovers. Um, so small pet business owners and just people that really, really love their pets. Um, the basics of pet photography too. So we uh, sort of do two things, either teaching professional pet photographers more about their business and then also teaching just people like pet sitters um, how to take better photos of their pets because I hear all the time like my pet is too black and they're just a big black blob in the photos or my pet's too energetic and they're just blurry in all the photos or they have the weird flashing eyes in my photos. I have all these sorts of different complaints that I hear from people. So I really love teaching them how to make their pet photos better because I'm guessing you're the same as me and we all love pets. (laughs) We do. Well, and we want to give our clients something worthwhile and we want to give our something or give our clients something of really high quality, right? Because that, that not just speaks to how much we appreciate them and how much we value their pet. We want to give them something good because that speaks to our, our, our service as well of when we're caring for their pet. Everything we do, we want to be excellent. And that, that includes the photos. Now, I imagine um, that all your clients are probably similar to me when I hire a pet sitter and they're kind of waiting for those updates. <laughs> Is that the sort of photos that you're talking about that, that you're sending through? Yeah, our daily update photos, um, or me, sometimes do we put together special event photos. Um, if it's a holiday ah. or something like that, we can do those kind of things as well. But the, the bread and butter is those daily updates or those walk updates. And you're right. The client is sitting there watching their phone a lot of times, waiting to hear that ping. And then they're, boom, they're on, they're scrolling, they're zooming in, they're seeing how everything's going. <laughs> right. And then I guess, do you get... Um, you know, a little bit of word of mouth. Do those clients then share those? If it's a good photo, they then share it on social media, that kind of thing. Is that so that where it helps you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So there's the, there's the resharing of a photo, right? That's always uh-huh. really good. Um, there's the um, walking into a client's home and seeing a photo that they that we took printed off and hanging on their wall sometimes. Uh, then there's the, we can, you know, try and do something else with those photos right after we use them, after we take them. But yeah, there's giving that client that, that thing. A lot of times we think, oh, I just gave them a photo, but what we actually gave them is, is a tool to help promote my business at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. because if I give them a good photo, they're going to want to share that. Right. And that's invaluable when someone says, look at my dog or look at my cat and look how happy they are. X, you know, X and X, Y, Z pet sitting did this for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I would love to share some tips to help help the pet sitters improve their, their photography. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did want to know a little bit about, about you, um, about okay. you just per- personally, uh, before, we, yeah. before we get into that, because yeah. um, pet photography is very specific in my mind. It's, it's extremely niche. So tw- 12 years ago, what was it about pet photography that that drew you to that point were you a a photographer beforehand and were drawn in that direction or did you start off with pets I have basically always been a photographer so I started real young I photographed my first wedding at 16 
Um, I then at 17 went to New York on a scholarship um, to do a fashion photography course and then moved, so I moved around a lot and then I moved to Melbourne, Australia, which is where the accent's from. Um, So I moved back to Australia and studied fashion photography. So my pre-pet photography focus was very much on um, working more in commercial fashion, that kind of thing. So I worked a lot with designers, did a lot of internships, that kind of thing. Did some random weddings, um, kids' portraits, family portraits, bread and butter work. They didn't really light that fire. Fashion, I was really interested in the creative side of it, the um, behind the scenes side of it, not my jam. So I was really young and already feeling um, really disconnected with what I was doing. So I was like 21 years old and thinking, I really don't know if I can do this for the rest of my life. Like it's just this industry that I'm really struggling to find my place in. There was like no soul in it. Um, so I was having a really early, uh, early life crisis. <laughs> and then I adopted this dog. Her name's Lyra. And my entire world changed. All of a sudden she was teaching me to slow down. I was in this really, you know, fast paced, wearing high heels, up at six, staying up until 1 a.m. Um, this is an insane world. And then I got this dog and she just changed everything. And I had this sort of epiphany moment photographing her because she was this adorable puppy and I just wanted to, I was a professional photographer, wanted to capture everything about her. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this, this is lovely. <laughs> so. It started, I was just photographing her and it was sort of calming me down. Um, And then I was, you know, looking up dog photos, trying to think of some cool poses I could do with her. And I discovered that in America, it was kind of starting to become this thing. It definitely wasn't mainstream at that time. We're talking, you know, 13, 14 years ago. Um, It wasn't mainstream, but there were some professional pet photographers who were starting to, to to work and run businesses in America. And I thought, I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone thought I was absolutely insane. But I um, started Ragmuffin Pet Photography and sort of hustled like crazy. And within a year had quit all my other photography jobs and was full-time crack muffin. So I credit Lyra for absolutely changing my life for the better. It is a very different world. (laughs) I operate in now, no high heels, no late nights or anything. It's just muddy knees and dog (laughs) treats. poo bags in my camera bag, but um, it's amazing. I love it so much. Oh, sounds like our kind of uh kind of our cha- kind of jam yes. there that's awesome yeah, yeah, I love it <laughs> with your with your background in all those different types of photography and now doing pet photography what are some specific challenges of pet photography that other types don't really have it's it's the patience so you really can't approach um animal photography in sort of a fast-paced manner that a lot of other photography genres are about because you can't tell the pet hey can you quickly set the lights going and we need to take this photo just look at the camera really quickly (laughs) and if you do try to speed up or um if you're getting impatient or anything like that then as you guys will know the animals pick up on that energy so it's really, really important for us as pet photographers to sort of slow down, read the animal's behavior, read their energy, be able to tweak our approach depending on the dog um, or cat or horse or whoever it is that you're photographing. I personally photograph like 95% dogs. So I tend to, my language tends to be about dogs, but um, whoever you're photographing, being able to read their language. It's more, most similar in terms of photography styles, I think, as photographing newborns, like newborn babies, where you also, you can't tell them what you need to do. So you have to sort of work with them. That's more what pets is, is like. So it's it's very different, um, but very rewarding. 
Yeah, that patience part is really huge. And from a pet sitter side of things, there's the, you know, if we may have a time limit on the, the amount of uh, for our visit that we have with that pet, and we get rushed with a lot of the things that we do. And then I know exactly what you're talking about of, you've got your phone out, you're trying to take that photo, and you're just rushing, and you're trying to take the photo, and then the dog's just like, it is playtime, it's on, let's go. And then everything gets just derailed from there. And you're like, fine, I'll just send a blurry photo this time. Whatever, and you got to go. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, approaching these photos with, I'm, I'm going to need some time, some space to calm down to get these done. And I, I've got to give myself that because if I don't, right, I'm, I'm going to be stepping on my own toes as I try and get that photo. Yeah, I think a, a big um, mistake a lot of pet owners make or, or, you know, pet sitters, for example, would be expecting that they're going to be capturing amazing photos um, because the opportunity arises itself. Mm. So if you're going like, oh, I'll get some cute photos of the pet, I'll wait till they're doing something cute and I'll grab that. Now, every now and then you do, you get an awesome one and that's great. Yeah. But if you want to be purposeful and ensure that you're getting these great portraits, then waiting for it to come along is just going to end up making you feel rushed because all of a sudden they're doing something cute. You don't have your phone on you, so now you're trying to grab the phone and hoping that they don't move and stop doing the cute thing. And then, of course, they do, so now you have a photo of them blurrily not doing the cute thing. <laughs> And you've missed it. So to capture those moments that seem, you know, really candid and unposed and natural, it's actually about purposely and mindfully telling yourself, okay, in the next five minutes, I'm going to take this photo. And then you're not rushed. You can, you know, make sure you've got the right lighting, um, treats or toys or whatever you might need to get their attention on hand. And you can take those few moments to repeat. I can tell you for each one photo that I take that might be printed in a canvas, for example, I probably took five, ten photos on either side of it because, as I said, you can't tell the dog not to, not to blink <laughs> or to look at the camera. So there will be photos around the singular photo that ends up getting printed and that my clients see. There's other photos around it. So, yeah, having that patience to take multiple photos, not be rushing the pet, calm yourself, find the right lighting, that kind of thing. It only needs to take a few extra minutes, um, but it makes a huge difference. It does to go, okay, these, these, are, these are my photo minutes that I have right now. Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got the rest of the, the thing planned, and I may try and take some opportunistically as I'm going, but to set aside this, like, okay, these are what I have. And, and that really strikes me because uh, not too long ago, I was at a, a client's home and was coming up on the end of it and I was needing to capture a few more photos. And then I, and I did that. I stepped back and I just kind of assessed what was going on and tried to see, okay, do I need to get treats? Do I need to try and stage something? Do I need to capture them doing this other thing? And then just at that moment, while I was being observant and watching, Mimsy, this ancient doodle, just walked up to the top of the, the, the drive and and laid down and rested her head just on this little tiny little ledge thing and like i was at like I, man pounced on that real <laughs> real yeah. fast but it was, like, it was one thing that like if i wasn't going where's the photo like how am i going to take a uh uh where's the opportunity for this photo in this i would have missed that right and just not having that time to pay attention and then engage uh, if you're too busy doing other stuff you are going to miss those little moments yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't look, it doesn't have to be, um, oh, hey, I'm taking a photo now. So let me try and work out a cute pose that, let me try to pose them. As you said, it can just be, I'm going to take a few moments here, a few minutes and photograph them. And you can be following them around and capturing one like that one of Mimsy with. It's just them doing something natural. So it's not like, okay, now I have to get them sitting because then all your photos are going to look the same anyway. It's just yeah. the dog sitting with the grass in the background. So being able to capture, you know, whatever's behind in the client's home, that kind of thing, something more natural. But telling yourself, okay, this is my photo time. Yeah. Um, makes them so much more enjoyable for you too, rather than just trying to grab your phone quickly. And, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and as you said, like we don't, these don't have to be portraits of the dog sitting still, <laughs> staring squarely at the at the at the camera, right? They can be the dog being natural, and that's something that I've 
I've really seen of the more natural the photo, the the more the owner, the more the client tends to connect with it, right? They tend mm-hmm. to see, because then what's that getting? That's getting that dog's personality in that photo. And that that's what really helps them connect with that. And it gives them something that they're going to have for the rest of their lives. Because Mimsy, that dog, uh, she is really getting up there. And I cherish every moment that I have with her. And I know that every single photo that I send of her to her clients is a photo that they didn't have before and that they don't see her in that light where I'm being able to capture those whenever I'm over there. And that's, that, that's where a lot of this gift comes from that, that we're able to give our clients. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Susan from The Pet Gal has this to say. Time to Pet has helped us grow exponentially. We believe the platform's features make us by far more professional than other companies who use conventional dashboards. They are the software gurus constantly developing and improving the platform based on user feedback. This decision was a good one. If you are looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. Do you guys ever do anything? I'm I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of pet setting businesses, obviously, but is there like VIP clients that you would then, you know, compile photos from a whole year, that kind of thing, make a little photo book? Is that yeah, so this right. yeah, so that, that's a question that I wanted to 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 ask ask you in a little bit. But yes, that that ha- we can't we do that at, especially around the holidays um, mm-hmm. or around a pet's birthday or maybe after the pet has passed away. That's a gift mm-hmm. where we can go in and oh. we can compile this long photo history. You know, again, weed out some of the more blurry ones. But <laughs> even those, yeah. even sometimes those are really cute because they've got a good story with them. Yeah, and that's a, you're right. That that is something that we can do. We get here's a window that we had into your pet's life that you, the owner didn't have because you were gone while you were traveling. But now here are these moments for you. And that, that's something that we can give them that, that really does impact them. And as you said, for the VIP clients, this can be something it's not, you know, printing books is kind of costly, especially photo books. Um, but it is something that we can do that now is added extra value. It's added better connection with them. And, and it's, some, it's again, a gift that we can give them. And as a VIP, VIP client, they pay us a lot of money for the rest yeah. of the year in services. And this is just a small portion of that that we can do for them. Yeah, I think as a client, I would be wowed by that. And wouldn't have to like, honestly, with photo book printing these days, you can get it relatively good for a VIP client, be a relatively low cost. You can do it for like $25, $30. Um I think that would be amazing. So if you had had the photos there, um, then what what a cool gift! Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I, you know, you've actually published several books around photography and of photos of dogs. So what what was that process like for you? And I'm very more really interested to know how you knew what photos to include uh, versus exclude because that's something that I feel like I would struggle with immensely. Right. So I mean, after so many years of culling photos. I, that's an awful word, but that's that <laughs> Yeah, so a, a big part of my job is get you have the entire shoot, which might have several hundred photos, and obviously the clients would be completely overwhelmed if you send that many through, which, by the way, applies to pets to this too. You don't, if you take 25 great photos you don't have to send them the 25 great photos because it's just it's just overwhelming no one needs that many um anyway so a big part of my job is is being able to look look at photos and pick which ones stand out the most and it really obviously is very subjective photography is but it comes down to whether or not you feel that's the spark of the dog's personality in them um, obviously there's things like is it is it technically good is it not blurry is it well exposed so it's not too dark it's not too light um, are there some catch lights in the dog's eyes so are the dog's eyes sparkling um, is it you know got a good depth of field so I quite like it and it's a sort of modern style of 
photography in general to, for the background to be blurry. So all those sorts of technical things, that ticking those boxes, but then it really comes down to whether or not I'm feeling like it's sort of capturing something unique about the pet um, and about their personality. Oh. So before you do the photo shoot, do you interview the client about their dog or about their pet and, and try and suss out some of the information beforehand? Very much so. So I have a pretty in-depth questionnaire that I fill out with the client because I will customize and any professional photographer should be doing this um, with with their pets. So I'm customizing my approach. I need to know things as well like um, are there any behavioral issues? Are they nervous on leash? Um, Are they nervous around other dogs? So that might make me change the location that we're going to. Um, You know, are they old? Are they blind, deaf? There's all these different things that will adjust what I, how I'm approaching the pet. But then I also want to get a feel for their personality and probably more importantly, their connection with the human, because unlike what you guys are doing, a lot of what I'm doing is that bond between the human and the pet. So I want to capture that as well. So sort of knowing how they interact together and their favorite things to do. But yeah, definitely have a questionnaire beforehand so I can find out all the all the cute things that make them mean. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good point though, is that we as pet sitters, we get to interact a lot more with the pets than than you get to, Caitlin, because it's usually a one off. Sure you may do a pre meeting and then you do the photo shoot and then you're you're off to editing and binding and off and and done. But we do get to see them time and time again. Um, but we also do get to know the clients. And so if they start saying things like, Oh, I, I always love it whenever they go sit over here, or you know, this is they start telling you these funny things about their personality above and beyond what you see or what you notice. That that's that's a great idea to try and capture some of those for the client while they're away. I honestly think you guys have this really um, special opportunity here because, yeah, as you said, I'm I'm meeting these dogs once. I'm trying really hard to connect and get to know them as quickly as I can in an afternoon, um, and I'm basing a lot of that on what the client has told me but you're really getting to know these pets on, on a personal level. So I think um, it's almost more akin to the photography that I create of my own pets rather than my client's pets because my own pets or my friends and family, that kind of thing, where there's sort of a bond that I personally have there. And I think you can see that in photography, not to <laughs> imply that the work that I do for my client doesn't have that fun. But I think it is different when there's sort of, it's like, I don't know, it probably sounds a bit soppy for me to say it, but when I'm photographing a pet that i have personally connected with, it's almost like telling a love letter um, or announcing a love letter to the world. If you can capture a portrait that is capturing what you are seeing in them and what what you're connecting with and if that shines through then I think viewers of that photograph can see it and certainly your clients would be able to see it if you if you're seeing something that you think is special about the pet that you're looking after and you've captured it then that says something that you took the time to capture that and that says something to the client about your connection to their pet so I think that would be really special. Yeah. And well, and at that level, we're also able to anticipate the, their moves and anticipate mm-hmm. how they're going to react and respond. And it's, it becomes a lot more of a two-way communication at that point. You know, yeah. I, you mentioned about, you know, you latch on to things that, um, or, you know, pesters can latch on to characteristics that they, they hone in on. And I have a, we have one of our uh, clients, his name's T-Bone. He's a chow and he loves the cold. I mean, he's, I mean, he is chow through and through. He would be in the snow every single day of his life as he possibly could. And the last snow that we had, it's the last snow of winter, knock on wood somewhere, please. <laughs> um, he came running up to me with just a face full of snow. And oh. I was, I was looking to get a, a photo. I had my photo moments and I managed to get a, a, a full perfectly in in frame and non blurry uh, portrait of of this c- snow covered muzzle of this dog and it was like that's t-bone that is that is a quintessential t-bone in every possible way <laughs> and i was just it was it was i was like 
I, I got that, right? And that, that was for me and, and when the client saw that too, she said, that's him. That's exactly who he is. Oh, that's so great. I'm jealous that you have snow. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> sorry. So sorry. Uh, no, it'll be the last I speak of it. Um, <laughs> I, I want to get into a little bit of the technical aspects mm-hmm. of photography um, because we are, the majority of us are, are shooting, our, our, our field cameras are our cell phones. Right, and I know you're shooting with a different, very different glass uh, than, than we are. So I want to start off by asking, what what do you shoot with? Um, kind of, what's your favorite go to? Um, well, I shoot with a Canon One DX um, Mark III. If that means anything to you guys, it is way overkill for what pets it is need. Um, so it's a DSLR, is a digital SLR, uh, but you can very much these days capture beautiful stuff with your cell phone so don't feel like you need to go out and buy a camera to be improving your pet photography at all um a lot of the students that i teach are taking their photos on on their cell phones the um, course that i have teaches both cell phone and uh digital camera photography so absolutely cell phones are amazing these days for that but yes i have the big daddy whopper (laughs) of a camera and the reason why as a professional photographer i need that is um because we're blowing up the the photos really large so unless you're printing you know 30 by 40 inch canvases of these pet photos which i assume you're not um you really don't need you know, the pixels. Um, and then, you know, my camera also gives me the ability to shoot really high frames per second. And basically like blah, 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 photos, um, which even cell phones these days can do a, a lot of that, but really high frames per second. And it also gives me the ability to shoot on manual mode, which means that I can completely control the exposure. Um, so if you're starting to, you know, really get into photography um then getting a dslr is certainly a a nice way or a mirrorless camera um those are a lot lighter but also give you the opportunity to to manually control the aperture the shutter speed the iso all those all those great different tools to allow you to control how the photo looks there's a lot of utility in having those um but Mm -hmm. who, who stick with our cell phones for now, at least, I, I'm 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 looking going to go do some hunting around on Amazon after this. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, <laughs> how, how do I make the most out of my 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 camera phone out out of my out of my smartphone? So it really depends on what kind of photo you're taking. But let's say we're taking a portrait of the the animal who's not moving. Okay. Then, because. There's kind of two, there's two different kinds of pet photos that we were typically taking. Either it's an action one or it's a portrait one. So pretending we're taking a portrait one, there's portrait mode on um, iPhones and Androids, I think, also have something similar where it's creating a false blurry background. So using that will sort of um, give it the same effect as if you were using a DSLR with a lens and having a small, uh, a wide aperture, which gives that blurry aperture. So the aperture is the hole in the lens. Um, okay, I'm good. <laughs> I love <it>. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking photography. So That's basically cool. the aperture is that you might have seen f stop like f 2.4 that kind of thing in the past um, lots of confusing numbers when it comes to, to photography but basically what you need to know about the aperture it's the hole that lets light through into the camera it's like the camera's eye um so if it's very dark then you want more light to come through so you you have a bigger hole lets more light through something about the light bouncing around in the lens i won't i won't get into the science of it but basically that then creates this blurry background we love that blurry background for multiple reasons. One, it just looks real nice. <laughs> um, real creamy background there. It allows us to have to reduce any of the distractions in the background. So, you know, a messy house, um, construction in the background, other people, other pets, that kind of thing. So by having that blurry background, we really just focus in on the subject, i.e. the pet that you're sitting. Um, 
and we don't get all the distractions out of the background. So blurry backgrounds are really great and using your portrait mode can allow you to do that. Now, the cool thing with um, cell phone portrait mode is you can actually go in, you take the photo on portrait mode and then you can adjust the f-stop because it's not real. It's just, it's fake. And sometimes the effect doesn't work that well, but most of the times it, it does work pretty well. And your iPhone will tell you, you need to move a little bit further backwards or a little bit closer, that kind of thing, which again does mean um, it, it's not for the quick grab your phone quickly and be able to do it. You need to be taking the few moments to set yourself up. Um, but yeah, that that I would say is a great place to start to sort of give your photos a little bit of oomph. Um, And then my second tip with taking portraits would be to get down on their level. So there's um, with perspective with photography, we're talking about like uh, the photographer's angle of view or the, the angle that you're holding the camera at. So most of us without even thinking if we're not taking the time to plan what we're taking, how we're taking the photo, we would just take the photo from whatever position we're currently in. So if we're walking the dog, then we're standing up and we take the photo. Um, Or if we're sitting on the couch and the dog's doing something, we, we stay sitting and we take the photo. But because the dogs are down, you know, knee height, or down, what that essentially means is we're pointing the camera down at them and it has a really flattening effect for the perspective and it sort of creates like a 2D effect and it's hard as the viewer of the photograph to connect with the subject if we're looking down on them and there's no depth to it. You wouldn't believe, it sounds like the most simplest tip in the world, but the difference that it makes and what I'll do is send you a photo of a before and after with angle of view if you have show notes or something because I'm trying to describe something super visual here but the difference that it makes just getting down to the eye level of the pet that you're photographing and taking the photo from there game changer honestly that's my like super simple tip but that it makes such a difference and all of a sudden that portrait will look professional and look like nothing else that the client has because all their photos are taken from the photographer's angle of view. So just getting down to the subject's eye level, huge difference. It's also a much more intimate perspective, isn't it, right? And and that perspective is a lot of times where the client may is at that level a lot of times too. Right? Mm-hmm. The client that that's how they know their dog. They know their dog from being up face and then personal and seeing them at that level when they're cuddling and when they're when they're handling them and when they're grooming them. This kind of more alien perspective of way up high. Um, they that's that's not what they connect with, as you said. That's not that's kind of uh, foreign to them in in that perspective. Yeah, it's. I mean, it is what most of their snapshots are going to be like because we don't think when we're taking a photo, we don't think, let me lie down on the ground. (laughs) Um, But that's what I'm talking about here. Like, honestly, after a shoot, I am filthy, covered in mud because I spend most of the shoot literally lying on the ground um, to get down to, it's so nice if I have like a great day or something, because then I can just sit on the ground. <laughs> but most of the dogs I'm photographing you as close down to the ground as possible so that my camera lens is parallel to their eyes. Yeah. Um, huge difference. Pet Perennials makes it easy as one, two, three to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this awesome direct-to-client gift service that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches our client or employee. All gift packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get-well wishes, welcome new and rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business account to unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is leveraged on an as-need basis, there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchase prices. Learn more and register using the link in the show notes and enter the referral code PSC at registration. You'll be given a unique coupon code to save $2 off any packages that you send in your first 90 days. 
those are portrait photos of kind of these face face on or you know um, straight into at their level. Let's talk about action shots because mm. I, I take care of dogs and they don't do a good job at standing still. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> how do I get better at that? It's everyone's biggest wish is to be able to take better photos of their action action pet photos Um, and it is tricky so be really um, patient with yourself in in this case because it does take a lot of practice to nail it but I have a few tips that makes it at least a little bit easier so when you're first getting started with trying to capture photos of your of your pets running again um, that angle of view makes a big difference so you want to be down on the ground Uh, makes it a little difficult if it's just you and the pet because you are going to get covered in dogs running on top of you. Um, it, like it's easier if you have someone to be throwing a ball or something, for example. But I've I've taken um, plenty of action pet photos with just me and the animals, so you can do it yourself. Just you might get covered in dog. <laughs> um, so getting down on the ground again so that you have that depth. Um, and then it's all about the lighting. So with um, action photos, we want as much light in the image as possible because we want to be using a fast shutter speed. So the shutter speed, unlike the aperture, the shutter speed is um, in a DSLR, there's a little uh mirror that opens up and quickly lets a light in and then closes down and it makes that click click noise um which they make a fake one <laughs> a fake noise when when you're using your cell phone but the same sort of thing with your cameras too basically if there's a lot of light in the image that you're capturing then the camera doesn't have to have the shutter open for a very long time because light is what's actually creating the image. So if if it's a really bright day, then it can just open the shutter really quickly. Um, and then that means it's not capturing the movement, so that blurry movement. So if you're photographing on a really bright day, then you can have a sh- faster shutter speed so the pet won't be blurry. So you want to avoid photographing in the shade, at dusk, um, inside inside pet photography, if you're not shooting on manual, inside action pet photography, if you're not on manual mode, is going to be really, really difficult. They're just going to be blurry. So you want to get outside um, on a bright day. Now, the angle of the sun is really important with our action pet photography. When I say you want to get outside on a bright day, try to avoid doing this in the middle of the day when the sun is right up on top of our heads because what that sort of creates is like if you had a light globe above you and you have those, you know, scary shadows under your eyes. Um, What we want is the light shining into the pet's face. So 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon typically or, you know, earlier in the morning, 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning where the sun's at a little bit more of an angle and then you would position yourself so that the sun is behind your shoulders and the dog is running into the sun so basically their body and their face is fully lit up and then there will be maximum contrast and maximum light on them so that your camera can easily lock in focus and expose them and it's going to capture them running um, quickly and freeze that action so that's that's my best tip is outside bright sunny day with the sun behind your shoulders and you down on the ground. And I'm taking that note. Hold on. Don't worry. I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry behind you. <laughs> no, uh, it, it, is, it is tricky because we love those shots, right? Because that's where a lot of the personality comes out. Sometimes that's just what the dog is. Like I, we're taking, you know, taking, of, taking care of, of, of a whippet or something like that. Like that, that dog will literally never stop moving. So knowing mm-hmm. some of the limitations going into this, going, okay, what, what am I going to actually realistically be able to capture? And I know for us, when we go into, a home, yeah, when we're d- taking photos, window blinds are open, all the lights are on, every possible thing is on so that we can get photos. And we actually try and plan the photos that we take throughout the day because you're right, knowing my late night visit where I'm going in at 9 p.m. at night, those photos are going to be very different. So I'm going to mm-hmm. save all of my here sit for a treat photos for at nighttime. 
and all of my running around are going to be my afternoon. In my morning, I'm going to try and figure out a combination between those depending on the daylight that I have access to. So actually knowing in order to get the best possible, here's where that planning comes in again of going, what can I actually realistically accomplish at each visit that I'm coming in throughout the day? And what am I going to have access and available to me? And that the, the lighting, that is so huge. And we tend to forget that because we've got our phone. I see the dog. It's in front of me. I'm clicking and it's blurry again. But like you said, we're dealing with the limitations of physics at this point, right? It's not that the phone is angry at you or anything. It's, it's <laughs> that it, it needs, it needs to, to, you know, it's blurry because it has to stay open long enough. And when it's open long enough, it becomes overexposed to the motion that's there. And then that's the kind of photo that we get. And we're left with that. So it's, again, realizing what can I do? What can I do? And, and planning those throughout the day really does help. Yeah, it's, it's the light hunting is such a huge part of taking good photos if you're inside um and they're doing something cute or you want to get that portrait and that's coming out blurry it could be something as simple as oh I see um the window is actually behind the pet so now their face is dark because it's behind them so just turning around so that the window is behind you and the pet is facing that window light suddenly makes a huge difference to the photo. So always taking into consideration where your light is coming from, particularly when you're inside, um, does make make a really big difference as well. Obviously, you can, with more practice, um, start getting creative with lighting. I love to do backlighting, which is when the light is behind the animal. But I do need to manually expose for that because my camera if the light's behind them or your cell phone, if the light's behind them, is going to see that bright light behind the pet and go, oh, I want to make sure there's information there. Mm-hmm. So it's exposing for the bright light and then the pet's really dark. So just turning them around so that they're facing the light. Well, yeah. And if you are interested in being in being more creative with the backlighting with these kind of more with these photos, understanding, okay, what, which one of my clients is going to be a good fit for experimenting with that kind of lighting, right? Maybe, maybe the 14 year old dachshund who naps all day, great time to experiment with backlighting. Not, with it, not so much. <laughs> not the with it or not the six month old Weimar writer. It's like, nope. Yeah. Right out. <laughs> but, but, but that just takes practice and that just takes experimenting and going, okay, I can do this with this. I, I can't really do that with this other scenario, at least not right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so much fun to experiment. Um, but yeah, I think taking into consideration lighting and as you're saying, the pet that you're actually photographing and what are your limitations there and your time. So another common one that comes up is, and you actually mentioned it kind of at the top of the show, was talking about trying to photograph black dogs. Um, mm-hmm. This th- this is insanely hard for us. So how do we get better at and, and, and pull off some good photos um, of the black dogs that we're caring for? Again, maybe unsurprisingly, it does come down to lighting. So... Because let's assume, um, I'm going to assume that you're not manually uh, adjusting your exposure. So let's assume again that we're using our, so we'll go the basics, let's assume we're using our cell phone. So our cell phone is picking the exposure for us. So what we want is um, the lighting to be as even as possible on the black dog's fur so that it's not really contrasty and the phone doesn't have to decide, oh, am I exposing for this white white spot of light that's here or for the really dark shadows? So either taking them into shade, like outside, so it's nice, even light, that will work really well because all the light is the same on their fur. Um, And it seems counterintuitive if you're not familiar with photography to be like, oh, it's a black dog, let's take them into the dark. Um, But it's because it's just a nice, even soft lighting that then your camera doesn't have to decide what it's exposing for. Everything's sort of a similar exposure. Or if you want to take them, if you're outside, for example, sort of the same as we would with action photography, just making sure that the light is behind your shoulders and facing the dog is facing directly into the the sunshine, then that will mean at least all of the light on their face 
is the same again. So you don't have those really harsh shadows or anything like that. Um, but you would want to be getting down on their level for that. So it's just, you know, blue sky in the background. Uh, but yeah, black dogs, black dogs are difficult, but it's all to do with making sure the lighting is as even as possible, because if there's any shadow on their face, then the camera gets confused and either overexposes. So then you have this weird gray dog <laughs> or completely <laughs> underexposes. And then you just have a big black blob. Right. You're just staring <laughs> off into the abyss. Neither pink, is great. <laughs> pink tongue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned a couple times about, you know, manual mode versus automatic. Mode. Are, do you have, uh, you, you may or may not, do you have recommendations for apps for phone to do more manual photography? If that was something we were interested in? Um, you can actually just do it with with your phone when we're doing our aperture. So the yep. portrait mode does the fake fake aperture for you. Um, and then the Lightroom app, which is free, I believe you can use that to change your shutter speed. Um, but honestly, there's um, if you are interested in experimenting more with your camera settings, then getting a camera that lets you do it that that's it you're really not going to get a lot of it from your cell phone but you definitely don't have to have the big daddy whopper camera like i do um mirrorless cameras are a great in between yeah um i think they would be great for pet sitters especially because they're really light so the dslrs are quite heavy but a mirrorless one will give you the ability to change your exposure settings but you won't have to be lying around this giant camera um, <laughs> to show you your hands are already full of things. Yeah, I, I know Sony makes a really good mirrorless with the Alpha series. <laughs> um, I know those are, those have tend to be full frame as well. So again, they can take those yeah. big wide shots that are beneficial in some of these situ- situations too. Yeah, I think um, mirrorless is what I tend to recommend, like my clients and students to to grab. Um, they're a lot more affordable as well, so you tick lots of boxes. <laughs> now you have a pretty, uh, you you have a very good aesthetic for seeing photos and capturing photos and knowing I got it and and this is now we can go on to something else. How do we develop that as as you know if we start being more interested in photography and these things? How do we start you know honing our our eye and and, and what we'd like to see? Um, this thing comes down to just taking lots of photos. <laughs> That's, um, so. When people, uh, when I have people who are interested in becoming professional pet photographers, I usually recommend they set themselves some sort of challenge. You know, you want to take a photo every day for a year. Literally practice just makes perfect, obviously with the technical side of photography too, but also in finding your own style, your aesthetic, um, developing your photography eye I do a free um five-day challenge for you know photographing your own pets so I have a lot of people do that as a way to sort of deep dive into what's my own approach to photography and learn how to you know take the basics as well um but finding something like that it's sending yourself a challenge um maybe you do that I'm gonna take five photos of each client's pet um, purposeful photos, not snapshots, but doing this thing that we're talking about where we're setting aside the five minutes or however long um, and setting yourself a monthly challenge or something like that. But yeah, it just does come down to the more you take, the more it develops. (laughs) You're right, because you start going, oh, I I had that aperture and that didn't work and that f-stop was awful and I need to do this and that lighting was like this because you're going to get multiple. It's it's about finding the right combination of where you start mm-hmm. finding that comfortable and where you start going. Ah, that's where that's working. And that you're right. That just takes that just takes time and practice, which can be frustrating for a lot of people to know. No, just tell me the right settings and let's go. And it's like no, no, I know we, <laughs> doesn't. Yeah, like that's yeah, the case. I know. <laughs> um, I think it's important to what you just mentioned of actually taking the time to then review them. So there's no point, you know photograph taking 20 photos and then just picking one and posting that and not looking through the 20 photos and you haven't learned anything from them so not that you then have to you know take an hour to look through all your photos but just taking a couple of extra minutes 
yeah. to actually look through. Um, and I would recommend deleting the ones that didn't work so that you, one, aren't going to take a huge amount of space on your phone, but also it sort of forces you to go, okay, is, is this worth keeping? Yeah. And be harsh with yourself. Is this worth keeping or am I deleting this? I want to find one from this set of 20 that I'm keeping and I'm deleting the other 19. Mm. And that will force you to actually critically look at whether or not it's a good photo and then for think about what is it that I should have done differently to make that a better photo. Yeah. And with a lot of the software packages too, you can look at a lot of metadata in that photo to see what was the f-stop, what was the aperture, what was the exposure, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Back when, you know, it was it was a film, like you had to write that down. That's what we would do. We'd have our little notebook and we'd go, okay, picture one, I'm setting my aperture to this and my, and my f-stop. And then you take the photo so that you could go back and line out all your photos and go, okay, that combination was awful. Delete, delete aka throw the L bin. Yeah. That one. <laughs> but that way you can start seeing, okay, what, and, and that's where that skill comes in, right? Because then that's where this natural ability to understand what's going on. It just takes practice to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I would say was a quicker fix than take lots of photos, take so many photos. <laughs> but it's the mindfulness behind it, like purposely taking them and reviewing them. Yeah. Now, I know you also you know, work with pet photographers to, to build their business and stuff. I, I did want to touch on that a little bit because it's, it's fascinating to me about how, and I want to know kind of how you find and communicate to clients the, the need for pet photography. Yes. So it's, as prof- professional pet photographers, it's really more that we're creating um, sort of a keepsake for the, for the client a lot of the time we're creating portraits that are the clients with their pets, which obviously isn't something that they can capture themselves. Um, so a lot of the photos that my clients love is, you know, the family photos or the snuggly ones, um, that kind of thing. And then obviously I'm taking individual portraits of the pets as well. But it's just um, that they really want something special to be hanging up on their walls um, or albums, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's more what our clients tend to come to us for is, is a, a keepsake. It's, you know, once in their pet's lifetime usually that they will do this. Yeah, I was one, I was going to ask about that. Do you find that there are certain times of a pet's life, whether it's a new puppy or whether it's a lot of end-of-life photos that you find yourself doing? Yeah, it's not – it's a really bittersweet. I do find myself doing a lot of old end of life doggy photos, um, which is simultaneously my least favorite and most rewarding part of my business. Um, They are devastating sessions when it's like, I mean, sometimes it's just my dog is old, so we need to get around to this. Those are great. Love an old dog photo shoot. They're funny. Um, They're sweet. They've got their little sugar chins love it um but sometimes it's you know we've been told we've got weeks and we've suddenly realized that we only have blurry out of focus photographs of our dog um or we have no photos of us with our dog that kind of thing um so you know i'm rushing to photograph them as soon as the client is ready i will move mountains to make sure that i can schedule in these shoots because as you guys know if they're told weeks, it, that might not necessarily, like it can suddenly be um, days. So, uh, yeah, rushing to fit in these shoots and they are really sad and I am I always end up crying during them, the client's crying, um, but they're also really special. So it's a funny, funny service that we provide as professional photographers. <laughs> Definitely not something that uh, any other genres deal with, but it is really meaningful as well. After 12 years in the business, what's been the most surprising thing about it to you? I'm not sure if surprising is the right. I've photographed some really interesting animals, so they're always fun to do. With. So I had a a pet duck who was fully toilet trained and <laughs> had his own couch and everything. That was amazing. I love this so and much. Then, <laughs> yeah, I've been blessed to, um, you know, work with wildlife rescues to do um, photo shoots for their campaigns. So I've 
got to photograph some really unique Aussie animals, wombats. I cr- I cried. I've now said it. I cry easily. As you can really tell. Um, I had this wombat shoot um, with these rescue wombats for this this campaign, and I've never been up close with wombats before but they are adorable anyway so I walked in and I'm like oh my goodness I'm so excited for this shoot so we're doing it in the studio um and then the the wildlife carer is holding one of these wombats and she goes oh do you do you want to cuddle <laughs> am I allowed she's like yeah there is this young wombat you can absolutely have a cuddle and I was trying to be all professional like this was a very um like it was a big campaign a big commercial photo shoot uh, so I was trying to be all professional. She hands over this one bat and I just start crying from happiness. And I'm like, are you okay? Like, this is one of the best days of my life. I can't get, believe I get to photograph a one bat. Oh, okay. Like I'm trying to compose myself, but oh my goodness. Anyway, that was oh. probably one of my favorite shoot days. <laughs> That's wonderful, though. But you know, awesome. <laughs> it's these intimate moments, these special moments that that nobody gets to see the behind the scenes of, right? And yeah, <laughs> you get to help capture that and experience that too. Like it's an experience yeah. for you as well. Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Caitlin, I want to thank you again for coming on the show today and for talking to us about photography, encouraging us to practice and giving us some great tips for fast moving dogs and to make those portraits really stand out. But I know there's a lot more. It's more than just that. And and especially if we're interested in taking it to the next step and going professional with this. So how can people follow along with you, get connected with more information and start seeing everything that you have going on? Oh, well, thank you for having me. In case you can tell, I do love to talk about things pet photography. Um, so I hope I didn't overload you guys with too much of the technical stuff. As I said, it's kind of tricky when we're talking about such a visual thing um, over audio. But I do have that five-day challenge that I mentioned. I run it a few times a year. It's totally free. I just I love doing, <laughs> love teaching people how to take better photos of their pets. So that would probably be the place that I would start if you're a pet sitter and you're interested in learning my best and easiest tips and tricks um, to take better photos of your pets, whether or not you're taking it on a cell phone or if you're going to grab yourself like a proper, quote unquote, proper camera to start doing these things with, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's the best place to start. So you can follow me, Ragamuffin Pet Photography um, on Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. Um, I can pop you a link to Colin if you guys want to sign up to the wait list to hear about the next challenge. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, that's free and I love teaching people. So that's probably be the best place to start um, to improve your pet photos. Perfect. And I will plug you the Pet Photographers Club podcast uh, because that is fantastic. I love hearing the insights that you interview with guests every, uh, you know, all the time about their business and the awards, you know, you talked about the photos and everything uh, that win the awards each year and all the time. So uh, I will, I'll include links to that in the show notes as well. Uh, and then the link that you send me for that challenge to get on the wait list. Thank you so much, Colin. It's been really great chatting to you. I truly believe that photos, the, the photos that we take as pet sitters, as dog walkers, as pet care providers are a gift that we can give to our clients every single time that we see their pets. When we have those moments where we realize this may be the last time I see this pet or this client will really appreciate that I captured this part of their personality. That is a joy. That is something we get to do every single day. And the photos that we take communicate that. So above and beyond the update that we send, above and beyond the marketing potential behind that high quality photo, it is the gift that we give to that person. It is that love letter that Caitlin said that we get to provide the client every time we come over and care for their pet. So we really want to encourage you to level up your photography game and to continue to give excellent photos and updates. They really are the backbone to everything that we do in this business and in this industry. We want to thank our sponsors, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials for making today's show possible. And thank you so much for listening. We'd love to get your feedback on how you've improved your photography skills. And if you still have any questions that you need answered about how to handle photos in certain situations, we'd love to talk you through all of those good things. 
We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll be back again soon. I'm <laughs> sorry.